My name is Steve Jones. I'm the preaching minister here at Vero Christian Church. I want to show you a slide up on the screen. And um, see, can you tell what this is a slide of what's happening right here? This is an awards ceremony at the Olympics. Now, this particular award ceremony, any, anyone know what team that is? Yes, that's right. That's the United States hockey team from 1980. They won the gold that year. Now, they were not predicted to win the gold that year. Who was? Russia. USSR was predicted to win the gold. However, in the semifinals, the United States team beat the Russian team. It's called the Miracle on Ice. Sports Illustrated subsequently named that the single most incredible moment in all of sports history. So this is the team winning the gold. Now I wanted to start with that picture and get that in our minds because a similar moment is going to happen for every Christian. We are going to be standing on a dais before all the generations of the church, before all of the angels of God to receive our reward for the life that we have lived here for Jesus and the kingdom of God. And if you're new to us, and I know at least one person is, Travis, we're in a four-part sermon series, and this is sermon number three. So if you haven't heard sermon two and sermon one, I may raise more questions today that I answer, but you can go back and look at those messages if you're of a mind to. They're out there in the cloud somewhere. But today I want to talk about reward day, the day when we receive those rewards. And what that teaches us about those rewards. And we just look at three things this morning. Number one, reward day is certain. Reward day is certain. Now the Apostle Paul, as he was traveling on his missionary journeys, came to the city of Corinth in Greece. And he was preaching there for a number of months. And after a number of months, his enemies were irritated with him. So they drug him before the proconsul there in Corinth. His name was Gallio. He was the local magistrate. So they drug Paul before what's called the Bema, B-E-M-A. That's a Greek word, and it means judgment seat. Now, archaeologists have found what they believe is the actual Bema in Corinth that the Bible speaks of, because as you know, the things that are recorded in the Bible, they actually happen. And the Bema is an elevated platform about seven and a half feet above the pavement where the Apostle Paul and his accusers would have stood, and Gallio looking down upon them. And of course, Paul's accusers, their accusation was that he was teaching the people to worship God in unlawful ways. And after they made those accusations, the Apostle Paul began to defend himself. But by that time, Gallio had already made his decision. He said, I don't care about these things. These are just matters of your own law. Case dismissed. But that must have left an impression upon the mind of Paul. And he used it years later when he wrote a letter to the Corinthian church. He referred to a bema. In fact, the bema, the judgment seat of Christ. Now this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. He said, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's, that's the word bima. So that each one may be repaid according to what he has done while in the body, whether good or bad. So notice that this is a judgment that every individual Christian is going to experience. Each one. And it's going to be based upon things done while in the body. That's our life here on earth. Things we think, we say, and we do are going to be judged in heaven as we stand before the Bema. So the Bema, the judgment seat, represents authority, reward, punishment, and justice. Certainty. Just as certain as that Bema is still there in Corinth, that judgment is going to take place we can count on it. Now let me read you a letter that I recently received. This is an actual letter. It's not a preacher story. This actually happened. Dear Steve Jones, my name is Richard Payne. I'm a partner at the Joe Hall Law Firm, Ontario, Canada. There is an unclaimed life insurance policy held by our deceased client, 
in the sum of nine million eight hundred and twenty thousand U.S. dollars. The policyholder was Mr. Alan Jones. He died in an accident in Toronto nine years ago, and since his death, no one has come forward for the claim, and all our efforts to locate his relatives have proved unsuccessful. Of course, in my experience, when there's money on the table, the relatives come out of the woodwork, but not in this case. The insurance company code stipulates that policies not claimed after 10 years must be turned over to the abandoned property division. So we've only got one year to act here. Therefore, I ask your consent to be in partnership with me for the claim of this policy benefit since, since, now here's what I've done to earn my claim, since you share the same last name. What's my last name? Jones. Very unique. They had to go all the way from Canada to Florida to find another one of us. Since you share the same last name and nationality with the deceased. Now, y'all didn't know I had dual membership in the United States, citizenship, and in Canada. Eh? If you permit me to add your name to the policy, all proceeds will be processed on your behalf. Now, he says, I want 10% of this money to be shared with a charity organization. So he's a tither. You're all in for a cut. While the remaining 90% will be shared between us, this is 100% risk-free. I will expedite the process in a highly confidential manner. And your earliest response to this matter would be highly appreciated. So what are the odds that you and I are ever going to see one penny from that $9 million, that would be slim and none. You know, we're kind of used to that. After you live a while in this world, we've been through scams. Maybe we've even been defrauded. We're used to people who are unreliable, undependable, who don't always keep their word, who say, I'm going to do something, but they don't follow through. That is not going to be the case with this judgment. We can count on it. It is certainly going to happen. In fact, the Bible says it is impossible for God to lie. This is one of the characteristics of God. It's called immutability. It means as far as his characteristics and his traits, they do not change. God cannot not tell the truth. And for a certainty, this is going to happen. All right, so we're saying three things here. Number one, reward day is certain. Number two, reward day is fair. It is fair. Paul writing again, 2 Timothy 4.8. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness with the Lord, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. So I'm at reward day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So there's, there's a judge on reward day. Now, we need a judge who is just and fair and righteous, also one who is compassionate, is able to take into account mitigating circumstances. Hebrews 4.15 says of Jesus that he was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus is all of those things, and Jesus is, in fact, going to be our judge. The judgment seat, the bema, is before Judge Jesus. John 5.22, Jesus said, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Now, Jesus is fair. That's my point here. Jesus is fair. Let me read to you something. In last year's NCAA 500-meter freestyle swimming championship, the national championship, Rika Georgi was denied a spot in the consolation final. As a result, here's what she wrote to the NCAA subsequently. She wrote, I'm a fifth year senior. I know what a privilege it is to, to make finals at a meet this big. This is my last college meet. That final spot, she wrote, was taken away from me because of the NCAA's decision. It hurts me, my team, and the other women in the pool. Now, do you know what NCAA decision she's talking about that happened last year? She's talking about the judge's decision to allow a man to compete in that swimming competition. A man who changed his name to Leah Thompson. He had been on the men's swimming team 
prior to this. Leah Thompson. Thompson competed and took first place in that 500-meter freestyle, which, of course, you understand, him taking first place bumped the women who were competing, bumped every one of them down one slot. So the, the woman swimming who got second, she would have been first. The one who got third would have been second. And so Georgi is saying, I was cheated. I was robbed. I mean, and there are scholarships and there are awards and rewards on the table. She says, I was robbed because the leadership was weak and cowardly and feckless and caved. We see that kind of thing. We look around and we see the injustice and unfairness in our world. We so often see a two-tiered justice system, do we not? There seems to be one for the rich, powerful, and connected, and then there's a separate one for those who are poor and powerless. Jesus is not a judge like that. He's not going to hold out a reward and then yank it back. Psych! You don't get it after all. He will not cave. He will be true and righteous and just. The standard that he has given to us is going to remain the standard by which we are evaluated. Now, we looked at this in last week's sermon. The profile of the life that God rewards. Things like seeking God, submitting, self-denial, serving, suffering, sacrificing, and sharing. Let me contrast to you two Believers who died and went to heaven in the Bible. When Jesus was crucified, how many people were crucified with Jesus? Two. Two. There was one on either side of him. What, what do we call those? Who were they? The thieves. Thank you. The thieves. Now, that is one translation of one of the words that refers to them. But there are other words which communicate the following ideas. They were thieves, robbers, criminals, revolutionaries, rebels, evildoers, and violent men. So these are the two men who were crucified along with Jesus. Now, one of those men, in the last hours, maybe last hour of his life on the cross, he turned to Jesus, he had a change of heart, and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responded to him, today you will be with me where? In paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. And so I think we can infer from that 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 man died and went to heaven. There's a high probability that that's the case. And we don't judge people's eternal destiny. But when Jesus says, today you're going to be with me in paradise, then that day you're going to be with Jesus in paradise. Now I said, well, let's contrast two men. So you got that man on the one hand. Now, here's the other person I want to contrast is Saul, who became the Apostle Paul. For the first, say, 30 years of his life, he was a devoted follower of God, a student of God's Word, a Pharisee, very strict in his observations of the law. Now, in his younger life, he was a persecutor of the church until he had a dramatic conversion experience. Then the last half of his life, the last 30 years of the Apostle Paul's life was lived in service and sacrifice for the Lord and advancing the kingdom. In fact, by his own description, Paul says that for the kingdom, he was beaten, scourged, stoned, shipwrecked, sleep deprived, hungry, thirsty, cold, mocked, betrayed, in prison. He traveled over 10,000 miles by foot, mostly in the Roman Empire, preaching and planting churches. He wrote half of the New Testament, explicating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, explaining it, its theological implications and applications for our lives. And then he died a martyr's death. Thirty years. Two men. One man did nothing. For the kingdom of God. Nothing. As far as we know, that's an inference, but he squandered his life. The other man, 30 years in hard fought service to the king. Both these men die. Is it true and is it right that both of those men 
are saved receive the gift of salvation? Yes, that is true. And that is right. Because the Apostle Paul no more deserved to be saved than did the thief on the cross. None of that 30 years of service to the kingdom counts toward his salvation. We are saved by grace. What does that word grace mean? Gift. We're saved by grace through faith. That salvation is the gift of God. It's all based upon the cross of Christ, the work that Jesus did, the righteousness of Christ. That's called grace. Having said that, though, is it fair and is it just that these two men receive the same reward in heaven? Is that true? No. That is not true, and that is not just, and that is not fair, and that is, in fact, not what happens. And this is what I want us to get in our minds, a separation here between the gift of salvation and the reward. The reward is based upon what we do in the service of the king. Different rewards. You okay? All right. Reward day is certain. Reward day is fair. And thirdly, reward day is revealing. It's revealing. Now, Paul's going to switch metaphors. We're not talking about the bema anymore in the judgment seat. We're going to talk about a building. 1 Corinthians 3.12. He writes, anyone who builds on that foundation. Now, we know from the previous verses, the foundation he's talking about is Jesus Christ. And he's talking about building the church. The church is the kingdom of God. And he says, so anyone who's building the church on the foundation of Jesus Christ, that's the context here, may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, or wood, hay, or straw. But on that judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. And we studied that word last week, misthos. It's wages, pay. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. So notice what is not being evaluated here is the person or our eternal destiny, one's eternal destiny. That's been decided when we believe. We repent of our sin. We confess Jesus as Lord. We're baptized into Christ. Our destiny is determined. We're going to be saved. We're going to heaven. It's the work that we do that's being tested and revealed at this point. Now we know that God does not just look at the bald actions themselves. He looks at the heart. I want to suggest these three gold standard tests of our works that we read about in Scripture. Number one, the test of relationship. Jesus says in John 15, 5, without me you can do nothing. We must stay connected to the vine, to the Lord. We must maintain that vertical relationship. In fact, in Revelation, as Paul, or rather Jesus, is giving a message to the Ephesian church, he says, I know your works, your labor, patience, nevertheless I have this against you, that you have less." Your first love, test of relationship. Number two, test of motive. Motive. Jesus said in Matthew 6, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. So motive-wise, we're always seeking to serve God and bring Him glory. And number three is the test of love. Again, Jesus, Luke 6, 35. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid then your reward from heaven will be very great. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. So this day is a, a revelation of our good works and our bad works. And one thing's we sometimes have a hard time getting our minds around that it will be possible to enter into eternal life without a lot of good work to show for the life that we have lived. 1 Corinthians 3 again, the, verse 15. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flame. And so the Apostle John writes in 2 John 8, watch out that you do not lose what you have worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent so that you receive your full 
reward. And again, 2.28, remain in relationship to Jesus so that when He appears, we can have confidence and not be ashamed in front of Him when He comes. We want to live our lives in such a way that we are realizing the full potential that God has built into us. God's built a potential into you, and He's built a potential into me, and His expectation is that we realize that potential. James Clear writes, each day is a small lifetime. Live a good life today. Shane Claiborne writes, we lose kids to the culture of materialism, drugs, and violence because we don't dare them. Not because we don't entertain them. We make the gospel too easy, not too difficult. Kids want to do something heroic with their lives. It's why they play video games and join the army. But what do they do with a church that teaches them to tiptoe through life so that they can arrive safely at death? The coach of that hockey team was named Herb Brooks. And Herb Brooks gave his team, before they played the USSR, a rousing pregame locker room speech. In the movie, Miracle. Now, Herb Brooks is played by the actor Kurt Russell. And we have his depiction of that speech. Now, it's, it's being delivered in the movie by an, an actor, but according to my research, this is pretty much what Herb Brooks said. This is what he said. Now, I want to show you a, I want to show you that clip. Let's watch it and listen to it. But you know, you know where I'm going with this. I want us to hear the voice of God. The challenge that he gives to them, let's hear that challenge for us today and then we'll come back and make a close. I'm about to cry. I don't want to be melodramatic, but this is our time. The past generations of the church are gone. We're not here by accident. I don't think anybody in this room is here by accident. We're here by destiny. The Bible teaches that we are created in Christ Jesus to do the good work that He determined in advance for us to do. You and I, let's live our lives for the King and go for the gold. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our Father in Heaven, we don't always remember, but we are reminded today that not only are we the recipients of the gift of salvation by your grace. But you have invested in us the great investment of life and a gift package and mix upon which you, re, you expect a return on investment. We want to keep uppermost in our minds today. We are advancing your kingdom, working for you, serving sacrificing, giving, seeking, and seeking those rewards that you have placed before us because that's the right thing to do. We're going to go for the gold with your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.